He is a most interesting man. Uh, joining us for the first time at our conventions, um, Robert is a double graduate from Sydney University and from Charles Sturt University in New South Wales. Uh, he is a religious education coordinator and he has had an extraordinary influence in terms of Catholic apologetics in and around Sydney and other parts of New South Wales. And if you want to know all about what that means, Robert will no doubt explain it to you. But we will listen with great uh, interest to what he has to say because he is a public defender and explainer of the Catholic faith. That is an extremely rare thing in this day and date. In this time, people don't publicly explain anything. Uh, but this young man makes a point of explaining it, and indeed that's his sole raison d'etre for what he does professionally and privately. Would you please introduce, would you please welcome, as I introduce, Robert Haddad from New South Wales. Thanks very much, Philip, for your kind and generous words. And I want to thank John Porteous for inviting me here to speak at the conference. This is my second trip to New Zealand, and it's a delight to be back. And it's an honour to be, and a delight and an honour to be asked to speak here today. Actually, the, I'm doing two talks this weekend, and it's really one talk in two parts. <clears throat> it's all related to the Eucharist. And the first talk which I'm presenting this afternoon is looking at the Old Testament and how God has always provided us with a spiritual food of one sort or another. I'll first draw you, your attention to a quote from St. Paul. St. Paul says in his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15, If there is no resurrection, eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But of course for Christians it is different. We do believe in a resurrection. And we also know that in God's original plan for humanity, we were not meant to die. As I said already, this talk is essentially about God's goodness and bounty towards us. How from the beginning of human history, he has provided spiritual food for his children. How this food was lost, though, through sin, and how God, again through unmerited mercy, restored to us a spiritual food even greater than what we originally enjoyed in paradise. And I want to take you in this next 40-odd minutes back to paradise and look at God's original plan for humanity and how he blessed us in those wonderful days. With our original parents, like all creatures, all creatures actually, everything that God has created, reflects God in one way or another, in one or more of his infinite perfections. Everything created is in the likeness of God. But for human beings, it was to be different. We were not simply in the likeness of God. We were in the image and likeness of God. And that was because God gave us two wonderful natural gifts for humans, which elevated us above all the other levels of creation, above the mineral world, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom. And those gifts, which are natural to humanity, are the gifts of the intellect and the will. God is pure intellect, infinite intellect, and God is infinite will. And by giving us the, power of, the powers of intellect and will, this is how we reflect God, in, to be an image and likeness of God. Of course, the power of the intellect is given to us by God to know, understand, and to judge. And the power of the will, which is the appetite of the intellect, enables us to love or to hate what we know, understand, and judge. But besides these wonderful natural gifts, God also bestowed upon us as human beings other gifts, five other gifts, and I'll explain them in some detail to understand why God gave us a particular spiritual food in paradise to sustain us. These gifts are in two categories, and I'll speak about the greatest gift first. The greatest gift that God gave our original parents was the gift of sanctifying grace, sanctificere in Latin, 
Grace that made us holy. It was a supernatural gift. That is a gift that raised our original parents above their human nature, elevated them to have a participation, a creative participation in God's own divine nature, supernatural, above. We read about this, and Peter ref refers to it briefly in one of his epistles, in his second epistle, chapter 1, that we become partakers of the divine nature, God being infinite, the creator, condescends to share his life, to gift us a share in his life directly. It's a creative participation. But in addition to this supernatural life that he gives us, which is created, God himself dwells within our souls, and he did so with our original parents. The indwelling of the Blessed Trinity, which our Lord refers to in the Gospel of St. John, recorded there in chapter 14. If you love me... My Father will love you, and we will come and make our abode in you. We will come and live with you. And Adam and Eve, gifted in this wonderful way, not only created participation in God's life that elevated them supernaturally, but they actually had God dwelling within them in their souls. This is how Adam and Eve became essentially adopted sons and daughters of God, adopted children of God. How can a finite creature be a child of the infinite creator? God enabled that through gifting himself in this way to us. Now, four other gifts as well, in addition to this supernatural gift. Gift that we categorize in the Greek word preternatural. Greek preta, meaning beyond nature. These were other gifts that God gave our original parents to enable them to live perfectly as humans in paradise. And there are four preternatural gifts. The four eyes, so to speak. What were they? Infused knowledge was the first one. Adam and Eve didn't have to learn. God, when he created them, infused in them already all the knowledge they needed to live perfectly in paradise. We saw an example of that being used by Adam when he named all the animals. He didn't just call any animal, any animal, any old name. He knew through his infused knowledge the nature of each creature, what they were like in their essence. And he gave them a name that reflected that essence. In addition to infused, infused knowledge, the second preternatural gift was the gift of integrity. This was a wonderful gift that enabled Adam and Eve to have a perfect harmony within themselves. Their reason was obedient to God. And their appetites, their desires, their passions, their lower powers were obedient to reason. There was this perfect harmony within them. We can understand that harmony in one sense when we know that now because of original sin, we have a disharmony. We have a clash between the spirit and the flesh, as St. Paul says in Romans chapter 8. But in those days, in that time, with the gift of integrity, there was no war between the flesh and the spirit. There was a harmony and a union. Everything obedient to God and everything under our reason, the powers under our reason were obedient to reason. In addition to this, as well, as I add as a sidelight, all the other creatures on earth were subject and obedient to Adam. He had dominion, lordship. He was the lord of all creation on earth. And that, that peace, that harmony, though, was lost and disrupted also by sin. But that's another topic I can't go into in too much detail now. The third eye, the third preternatural gift, was the gift of impassibility. You've heard of the term passion, the passion of Christ. That's Christ's sufferings that he endured for us, out of love for us. Well, with impassibility, that particular gift, our original parents were to be free from pain, sickness and suffering. And the fourth gift topped that off. The gift of immortality. We were not meant in God's original plan to die. There was to be no death. 
How were we to end our lives, so to speak, on earth in God's original plan? Well, Adam and Eve, being in paradise and gifted so wonderfully, commanded to multiply, increase and multiply, and they were to live happily in paradise, doing good works, growing in grace through those good works, loving God above all things, loving their neighbours themselves, a natural law operating in paradise. And after a certain time, For each individual, God would simply take each individual one by one into heaven, assumed body and soul into heaven without pain, sickness, suffering, decrepitude and death. We can see how the church teaches why Our Lady was assumed body and soul into heaven. Because she didn't have original sin and therefore one of the consequent punishments, death. And that was for her... A restoration fully of a gift, of a plan that God had for humanity from the very beginning. No death. Of course, all this wonderful plan and all these wonderful gifts, this plan was disrupted. And these gifts were lost because of sin. Let's recount what happened. We know the story. We know that there was one positive law of God in the garden. A law based on God's will. Do not eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For in that day you shall die the death. You disobey me, prove your love for me, obey me in this law and you will merit heaven. You will merit the beatitude, the, the, the beatific vision, the blessed vision of God face to face. Of course, the evil one, Lucifer, entered the garden And he tempted Adam. But he knew that Adam was aware of the law and was gifted by God. And Adam in himself, by himself, could have resisted the temptations brought forward by Lucifer. Lucifer was very sly. He determined to attack our original father through a companion, through Eve. If we read St Thomas Aquinas on this point, he makes it clear why Lucifer chose this path. Because if he was to confront Adam directly himself, Adam would have seen this creature as a stranger, as an alien who should not have been in the garden and he would have repulsed him. But if the temptation came through a companion of Adam, one whom Adam loved, Adam would have more trusted in the deception and accepted it. And that's what happened. The lie came through Eve and Adam accepted it. No, you will not die was the lie. God is a liar. If you eat that fruit, you shall become like God in knowledge. And our original parents swelled with pride and that was the basis for their disobedience. And the multitude of punishments that came upon them afterwards. Just before I go into the nature of the punishments, I want to look at another verse in the book of Genesis. Besides the tree of knowledge of good and evil, there was another tree that stood, that grew beside it. And it was the tree of life. We read it in in chapter 2, look at verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life. It was the fruit of this tree, the tree of life, that Adam and Eve were meant to eat of. It was this fruit that was to sustain their preternatural gifts of impassibility and immortality. Eating this fruit They were not going to die. It was a spiritual food that God provided in paradise for original parents and their children, which would mean that they would never die. They would never die. But because of sin, as I said, this was all disrupted. In the place of infused knowledge, when we rebelled against God, when our intellect and will turned against God, everything turned against us. There was rebellion. In the place of of infused knowledge came ignorance. In the place of integrity came rebellion 
antagonism, conflict between the spirit and the flesh. Our lower appetites, desires, emotions and passions became disordered. In the place of impassibility, pain, sickness and suffering. In the place of immortality came death. And God, how did, and he, he determined to inflict this punishment of death upon us. Adam and Eve were to be driven out of paradise, were to be driven out of the garden, were to be driven away from the tree of life and its fruit, out of the eastern gate, where they are to suffer other punishments. You are to earn your keep by the sweat of your brow. The law of labor came into place. We know what some of the other punishments were upon Eve herself. Pain and suffering and childbirth, for example. Let's read the account here. Chapter 3, verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever... Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Keep some of this, some of this imagery in mind when we look at the New Testament tomorrow. Here we have... Sin, rebellion against God. Our original parents were therefore no longer worthy to present themselves before the tree of life to eat of the fruit, the fruit of immortality. And they were to be cast out through the eastern gate. And the cherubim blocked the way they were not to return. They were not to return so that they would die. That's a very sad story as we know. But of course, even before this condemnation, this punishment is inflicted, we read about that in verse 22. But before that, in verse 15 of the same chapter, chapter 3, of course, we have the first gospel, the Proto-Evangelion in Greek, the first gospel, the first good news, the promise of the Messiah. We fell because of a tripartite conspiracy, so to speak, a fallen angel, the first Adam, the first Eve. But in the mysterious words of chapter 3, verse 15, we will have there promised a new Adam, the Messiah, who would come forth through another woman, the new Eve, who will be obedient this time. Not disobedient as the original Eve was in the face of the fallen angel, but obedient in the face of a new angel, the angel Gabriel, so to speak. And that cooperation between those three will see the restoration and we'll talk about the restoration in full tomorrow as I said when I introduced this talk we have an original gift original blessings lost through sin we're going to see how they are restored not only restored but even a greater tree of life planted and a greater fruit and a greater consequence of eating that fruit will be the gifts that God has replaced what we originally lost now, many thousands of years were to pass before the Messiah would actually come and restore all things. And we have another incident which, when we look at the Old Testament. And there are many types in this incident, in this story, which shows how God had intended to restore everything for us. It's the story of the Exodus out of Egypt. Let's put us in the picture completely here. Originally, the Hebrew peoples entered Egypt under Jacob. They were a small tribe, only 60 of them. Over 400 years later, 430 years later, there were at least 600,000 men. Could be as many as 2 million of the Hebrew nation. By the time Moses had come as the promised deliverer, who was to take them out from the yoke, the bondage of Egypt, challenge Ramses II, one of the greatest pharaohs in Egyptian history, and pulled the people of God out of Egypt and led them back into the direction of the Holy Land. 
the promised land. There's a lot of type here. There's a lot of imagery. Egypt represented sin, the bondage of sin, the slavery of sin. Of course, Moses was a type of Christ, the deliverer. The Hebrew people were the people of God at, the, at that time in salvation history. Represent us all today. They passed through the waters of the Red Sea. The waters parted. And they, Moses led the people of God through those parted waters. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that was a type of baptism. They passed through the waters as we pass through the waters to be the waters of baptism to be free from the stain of original sin, the bondage of original sin. The people of God passed through the waters of the Red Sea and the waters closed again to destroy Pharaoh's army. That is to destroy the stain of sin that had clung and enslaved the people of God. And they'll pass through the sojourn of Sinai. 40 years. That was an extra punishment given to the people of God because they whinged and they whined. They complained. They wanted to go back to Egypt. You were supposed to take us to the land of milk and honey, the promised land, which is a type. Jerusalem, a type of heaven, the heavenly kingdom. Ultimately, it was not to be Moses who would lead the people of God into the Holy Land. We'll see why in a moment. It was to be Joshua himself. We have types here again. The law of Moses can only take us so far to make us conscious of sin. And to struggle against that sin we're aware of. But it's Joshua representing here as a type of Christ. Joshua means the same as Jesus, Saviour. It is he who led the people of God into the Holy Land as it is the law of Christ, the perfect law of Christ, which leads us into the heavenly Jerusalem, heavenly kingdom. Now, here we have 40 years sojourning in the desert. That's one generation. That represents our life on earth, our journey through this valley of tears, struggling, doing good, avoiding evil. Working out our salvation in fear and trembling. We are to be, however, sustained in this, spiritual, in this journey that we engage in now. Likewise, the Jews in their journey through Sinai were sustained by God as well. And he sustained them in a mysterious way. I want to refer you back to the first chapter, sorry, the 10th chapter of St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians again. And read the following words. I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, the Red Sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same supernatural food, and all drank the same supernatural drink. For they drank from the supernatural rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. What is this supernatural rock that followed the people of God in the desert in, in Sinai? There's a Jewish tradition that has a word for this rock. St. Paul says very clearly, the rock was Christ. The Jewish tradition calls this rock the Evan Shemiah. It was a mysterious rock. Through that rock, God sustained his people in Sinai. Moses was asked twice to come before that rock. The first time he was asked to strike the side of the rock with his rod, which he did. And out came forth from the rock water, which sustained the multitudes in the desert, so they would not die of thirst. He obeyed. He struck the rock on the side, the right side, and came forth water. That is another very beautiful image there. Another very beautiful type, which I'm going to emphasize again tomorrow. We hear of another thing in the New Testament. Another rock which is struck in the side, in the right side, and coming forth was water in the New Testament. I imagine you can guess who that rock is. The second time... 
Moses was asked to come before that same rock and speak to it. But he lacked confidence. He didn't speak. He struck it a second time with his rod. Because of that lack of confidence, God gave Moses a temporal punishment on earth. He could take the people of God to the borders of the Holy Land and from the top of Mount Nebo, he can have a 70 kilometer panoramic view of the Holy Land, but he could not enter the Holy Land. His temple punishment was to die outside the Holy Land. That's why he didn't enter into it. It was Joshua who led them in. And that was because he lacked confidence in striking the rock the second time. So we have God sustaining his people through the rock with water. There was also another wonderful food that God sustained his people with. And that was the bread that came down from heaven. The Jews would see it every morning. For 40 years, God gifted his people with this spiritual bread from heaven. They wake up in the morning, they find it as a film on the ground, like dew on the ground. A white dew, which they could gather up, but they could not hoard it. They could only gather enough for each day because they were to trust in God's providence to provide them with their daily bread. One version I've heard is that this bread was so wonderful it could taste anything they wanted it to taste like. A bread that came down from heaven each day for 40 years. That's another image we're going to speak about tomorrow as well. But listen to what happened. There's wonderful gifts here. from The water from the side of the rock, the manna from heaven. That's what it was called. Why was it called manna? Because when the Jews saw it for the first time, they expressed in Hebrew, manna. What is it? They just said, what is it? They were amazed when they first saw it. And that's how it got the name manna from heaven. But look what happened. We go to chapter 21, verse 5. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? You've lied to us. You, Moses, and God, you have lied to us. You said that you were going to take us out of the slavery of Egypt and send us to bring us to the land of milk and honey. We're stuck here in this desert, the wilderness, year after year after year. And it gets worse. For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. They cursed the wonderful spiritual bread that God was giving them on a daily basis. Now God did not take this too kindly. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. So that many people of Israel died. Here is another type. A snake bite causing death. It reminds us of original sin. Lucifer, his snake bite, which caused death. Spiritual death to our original parents and mortal death, physical, natural death. Death came into the world because of a snake bite. And here we have again sin and God's punishing them for that sin, and he's punishing them with death through a snake bite. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. They repented quickly, and they sought the intercession of Moses for help. And Moses did intercede for his people before God. And God supplied the solution straight away. These were people who'd blasphemed, who'd sinned, yet God's mercy is abundant and immediate. But look what he does, very mysterious. So Moses prayed for the people and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who was bitten, when he sees it, shall live. Moses was asked by God to erect a pole in the desert and fashion out of bronze the image of a snake and place it on that pole. 
And whoever comes up who has been bitten by the snakes, whoever comes up before that image will be cured of the snake bite and will not die. That's why doctors today, I'm sure there are doctors here today, they have as their symbol the snake wrapped around the pole. Come before the doctor today and hopefully you will not die. He might wound you in your pocket, but you won't die. And here we have something mysterious, but we certainly understand it now. Why the image of the snake? I've heard two versions. One ancient, one modern. I heard the modern version first, so I'll give that one first. I heard it when I was listening to Scott Hahn's commentary on the Gospel of St. John. He said the reason why God asked Moses to erect the image of the snake on the pole is because the the people here were accusing God of being like Lucifer, a liar and a murderer. You've brought us out of Egypt, you've lied to us and we're dying here. You're a murderer and a liar. And so God said, all right, you betray me in that image, you betray me in the image of Lucifer, then Make an image that represents me like this, but nevertheless, I will still show you my mercy. Despite the fact that you think of me like this, like Lucifer, a murderer and a liar, I will still show my mercy to you. The other view was an ancient view by the apologist St. Justin Martyr, who wrote around the year 150 a dialogue with a an apologetical dialogue with a Jew named Trypho. And he explained it to me that the the serpent on the pole certainly represented Lucifer, but how he was to be crucified by the power of the cross. How his hold on humanity in his kingdom would be broken by another corpus on the cross. That's Christ himself. Both beautiful explanations. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit any man, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So, and that's what happened. And what we have here is a type of restoration. Remember in the Garden of Eden, there was a tree. Come up before that tree, eat its fruit, you will not die. Here we have another type. It's not the same, it's actually inferior. But here we have people who have sinned but now repentant and because of their repentance they are worthy to come up before this type of tree of life in Sinai and so to speak eat of its fruit. Look at this image and they would not die. It's an imperfect replacement for what was originally lost but it was a type of of another tree of life to come in the future which would be greater. Now, I don't know how I'm going for time. I think I've got about five minutes. Now, I was meant to speak about the Old Testament in this this talk and the New Testament tomorrow, and here I'm at the bridge right now. Because we know that this corpus, this snake on the pole in Sinai, was a type of the greatest tree of life that was to be planted by God himself. And we know that through Christ himself. And I'll jump forward to the beautiful Gospel of St. John. And we'll look at chapter 3. We all know chapter 3 to be famous. We're going to look at it a couple of times. It's all famous because of Nicodemus visiting our Lord at night. And the conversation he had about being born again, born again of water in the spirit. But there was something else our Lord said, which is wonderful. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Whoever went up to the first tree of life in Sinai was not to die. Whoever went up, to the tree of life in in Sinai Desert, the one erected by Moses, was not to die of the snake bite. And now our Lord is saying, as Moses lifted up the serpent, whoever comes up to what I will erect on Mount Calvary shall not die. Even more so, will have eternal life. 
Now, in, the, in paradise in the garden, who was to come up to before the tree of life? Those, all the children of God who were worthy, who were to come up before the tree of life in Sinai, all those who were repentant of sin and were now worthy again because of their repentance, who are now invited to come up before this third and greatest tree of life that our Lord himself is going to plant on Mount Calvary, everyone. Not just everyone at the time of Christ, in that generation, who were alive in 30 AD, not just those in Palestine and the whole Roman world and the whole entire world, but all people from that time until the end of the world. And I'll finish this talk by just looking at another passage in St. John's Gospel, in chapter 12, verse 32. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Our Lord invited us all then. From the moment he said those words up until the end of the world, he, invi he is inviting everyone to come now forth before this new tree of life and to eat the fruit that will flow from that tree of life fruit that will be not just for immortality but for resurrection and the life of the glorified body in heaven forever that is the invitation now it's an invitation for all of us to come up before a greater tree of life to eat a greater fruit, and we'll see what those two fruits are tomorrow, and to share in wonderful blessings. And it's more than a total restoration of God's original plan for what he had for Adam and Eve in the garden. Thank you very much.